tonight we're very lucky to have Dr. Michael Hathaway here. Michael is a professor of anthropology at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada, with a long list of additional titles and associations. Tonight, he will discuss his newly pu published book entitled, What a Mushroom Lives For, Matsutake and the Worlds They Make. This book includes, but is not limited to, the tale of how Japan's insatiable appetite for matsutake has created a supply chain from unexpected sources with far-reaching consequences. Or maybe it says ranging, I'm not sure. Probably both things are true. Michael explores the concept of the matsutake's role as a world maker, pushing the boundaries that limit most of our thinking when referring to a mushroom as something more than just an object. Everybody, please welcome Michael and uh, please keep yourself muted. Thank you. Okay, great, you ready? Yeah, so thanks so much, um, Natalie, for the introduction, for being the uh, surrogate Mike. It's been great being in touch with him and he had some incredible tales about his knowledge of these international trades and I'm, I'm, you know, it's too bad I can't be there in San Francisco with everyone uh, here tonight. And, uh, but the Bay Area is near and dear to my heart. I have family there and I've been living there on and off since the late uh, 1980s. Um, so that's certainly the place in which actually for me first a little bit in Oakland, but then moving down to Santa Cruz just totally opened my eyes to the incredible wonders of mushrooms that you're all, you know, deeply engaged in. And I came from the East Coast where I was just telling a friend the other day that, uh, you know, when I was 16 and found these giant puffballs and was so curious about them, then there was basically no one who could really give me any kind of guidance. And everyone was really petrified as I, you know, sauteed them up and, and, and ate them. But going out to Santa Cruz eventually in the, uh, the late 80s and early 90s, and I got to meet David Aurora and started to just to learn just, you know, just the, the tip of the iceberg of that incredible fungal world. And so for me, I'm, one thing I just really want to say is that I am, you know, I'm not a mycologist. I'm not even an amazing um, mushroom hunter as much as I want to be. And, um, but I'm an, I'm an anthropologist. I mean, I'm a deep uh, lover of mushrooms, but, and so what, one of the things that I do is I, take my anthropological training to both do more of the typical um, work of like a, what's called a participant observation where I work up in the Himalayan plateau in China with Tibetan people and E people for two of the people that in, in Asia have been probably the most transformed through their relationship with Matsutake. It's come in by the late uh, 1980s that trade started to pick up and it's been hugely transformative in how people live their lives there. So it's been um, a really big deal, like one of the biggest um, kind of life-changing uh, realms uh, for many of the people. And so that's one of the things that I've done as an anthropologist is to go alongside them in hunting and staying at their homes and trying to understand you know, how the Matsutake economy has changed gender relations, intergenerational relations, changed their kind of role in, um, in the ethnic hierarchy in, in places where they often had fairly low status uh, locally. And, and maybe some of you have even seen David Aurora's um, great article where he mentions the Matsutake mansions, these huge uh, homes that have been built with funding uh, that was derived all from uh, this one specific mushroom. Um, so I'll say that in general, that's the more kind of common anthropological um, perspective. But one of the things that I've done too is that I've brought my anthropological training to science itself. And so there's a number of people that are anthropologists of science that try to understand the production of knowledge as something that happens by people who are still uh, culturally immersed, who are understanding the world through particular uh, frameworks and metaphors and paradigms. And so that's also uh, something that the book really gets into um, in different ways. 
to explore these kinds of um, these histories and backgrounds that shape the uh, the way that uh, uh, fungal science has been developed. Um, and that's something I'm really interested in. So what I'll do um, for tonight is that I will um, read just uh, two sh very short excerpts from the book. And one thing to also preface it that the book is a bit, um, to have a kind of a grounded philosophy. So it's, it's kind of looking at the, um, the creation of scientific knowledge and the kind of frameworks that we use to understand the world uh, in a bit of a, a philosophical uh, point of view as well. Um, so here's, here's something that I'll start, which is just the beginning of uh, the first chapter that is called Fungal Planet. And um, it starts with a reference to this amazing book that I would recommend, um, Alan Weissman's book in 2007, it was called The World Without Us, that was a well-informed and speculative account that began with a simple yet powerful question, and what would happen to Earth if humans vanished? And Weissman shows us that there would be all kinds of disasters if humans disappeared, including the uh, the destruction of more than 400 nuclear power plants. Yet surprisingly, even with thousands of catastrophes, let alone the breakdown of our oil pipelines and so forth, he suggests that life on Earth would re quickly return if humans disappeared. Considering this scenario, I can help but ask my own version of the question by adding a fung to Weissman's query. What would happen to the world without fungus? So, what if all fungi disappeared from planet Earth? The world would be profoundly different and the result would be catastrophic. Fungi play a major role in decomposition. And, and here I think that many of you have some kind of a background um, of a number of these elements um, being in the mycological society, but maybe not in terms of like putting all of these together into one story. Um, so they play a major role in decomposition, that is, in breaking down the dead bodies of plants and animals and, of course, other fungi, bacteria. Without fungi, masses of dead grass, herbs, and trees would pile up and likely blocking the growth of the next generation. Not only would this take up land, but as importantly, the disappearance of fungi would mean that many of the planet's nutrient and carbon cycles would either grind to a halt or be so severely slow that some plants and animals would not have enough nutrients to keep growing. Thus, as life piled up, as death piled up rather, life could not renew itself. As scientists are increasingly learning, however, fungi not only play a crucial role as decomposers or rotters that break down life, they're absolutely essential to many forms of life coming into being, especially plants. As I will later explain in more detail, they do this through connections, between plant roots and fungal bodies. Fungi are living within and around the roots of nearly every plant on the planet. And plants have relied on fungi's assistance for hundreds of millions of years. If fungi disappeared, we would face a plant apocalypse as plants would no longer get enough water to drink and food to eat. Indeed, for most plants, more nutrients are provided by fungi than by their own roots. It is extremely difficult to imagine our planet without any fungi, especially as they are so diverse and omnipresent. Yet on the flip side, they are often unseen and relatively little studied. Fungi are all around us and also within us, but few of us know much or anything about what they do and how they affect the world. For some time, I tried to imagine the world without the one kind of fungus that I am most interested in, the Matsutake but I could not find enough scientific knowledge about the particular ecological role to envision the effect of its absence. What if all Matsutake just left overnight? It turns out that while Matsutake needs certain trees to grow, we don't know too much of the opposite reliance. There aren't any known trees that require in particular Matsutake's assistance. Many animals eat matsutake, but I couldn't find any that ate only this mushroom. So its disappearance, I assume, would likely not cause any known visible species to starve. 
I later learned that this was not completely true for there's one plant, the candy cane, Allotropa, that seems to rely completely on Matsutake. So if Matsutake disappeared overnight, Allotropa likely would too. But again, there was very little information about Allotropa's ecological role. So it was difficult in turn to imagine the effects of its absence. And this led me back to my original thought experiment about what would happen if all fungi disappeared. But this time I approached it from the opposite direction, not based on a speculative future where they disappeared, but on a possible past where they had never evolved. So taking this tack, I wondered what might happen if the history of life on planet Earth was looked at not through the usual focus on animals, but on fungi as central players. How might this history of life differ? First, such a shift would reveal some of the critical relationships that make our world possible and yet are little known. Second, perhaps more importantly, a fungi-centric view might reframe some of the dominant underlying frameworks that biologists use to explain life. For instance, accounts of life tend to focus on animal-centered forms of competition between individuals of the same species, like competition for mates or scarce food or habitat for activities like nesting, or between different species in terms of predator-prey relations. Such relatively simple and antagonistic relations are stressed in survival of the fittest accounts. This notion of life, which builds on Victorian British views of nature as red in tooth and claw, were first articulated as a scientific claim around the time of Darwin's main writings in the 1860s. More than a century later, such perspectives remain strong. I clearly recall my own indoctrination into such perspectives via TV documentaries in the 1980s when the announcer, David Attenborough, described in his authoritar authoritative older male British voice dramatic scenes as, quote, the ruthless battle for survival. These programs encouraged a vision of nature for us viewers that was overwhelmingly competitive, a vision that is now increasingly being challenged by a few ecologists, especially those who have worked closely with organisms that have prominent mutualisms with other species, such as bacteria and truffles, and are recognizable even um, in the intimate relations between animals and bacteria writ large. In my fungi-centric account, I emphasize the importance of complex relationships that are interspecies and even interkingdom, some of which are antagonistic, but many of which are not. So turning to macroscopic fungi, basic assumptions about the nature of their ways of being are now coming into question. For years, it was thought that each fungus fell into one of three categories. And this is something you probably all heard, saprobic and parasitic and mutualist. And here is um, from what, who used to be a Bay Area um, based artist, Carmen Olson, I'm not sure if you can see this, a very nice chart um, showing these three categories, but kind of how they work in kind of relationship as a kind of continuum rather than as three different beings. So we all have been told, right, that saprobes are the ones that eat the dead bodies where parasites eat living bodies and mutualists create mutual benefits with the living. And these were thought to be permanent qualities, fixed types of relationships between fungi or and plants or animals. Yet scientists found that some fungi can dramatically change their own modes of living when circumstances change. As early as 1925, researchers began to notice that some fungi were mutualists in the field, yet under laboratory conditions, they became saprobes. And in 1963, Kazuyoshi Hiromoto found the Matsutake in the field could change from being a mutualist to a saprobe within a single lifetime. Thus, these relations, Bernardo is fixed, but they can be dynamic. And this is one of the kind of changes in, in thinking um, specifically about mushrooms, but that is um, more generally um, some of these ideas that these categories that we impose on the natural world are 
are really there and kind of increasing kind of pushback to recognize the ways that the natural world is more complex than these categories. And, um, and then I'll read a short section from uh, part of the beginning of chapter two, which is called Everyday Fungal World Making, where I elaborate a little bit on this concept that um, Natalie mentioned. Um, so this is from part of the chapter called um, The Grammar of Animacy. And I don't know um, how many of you have had the pleasure to yet read Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding uh, Sweetgrass. But for me, when I first uh, came across it five years ago, it was really transformative and how I began to uh, think differently about the natural world and to have a, uh, an indigenous scientist to be able to um, think critically about the impact of English language and about scientific paradigms and how we build knowledge was really interesting. So I'll read this section. So, and this, the book kind of charts my quest to um, explore these different issues in a, in a kind of taking you along with me on my journey kind of uh, mode. So endeavoring to find lively ways to describe fungal lives, that's something I really wanted to do. I searched widely throughout the mycological literature. Occasionally, I found skilled science journalists like Jennifer Fraser and Ed Young, who could transform scientific articles into engaging essays that could be understood by a lay audience. But I discovered that scientists often cringed at how non-scientists quote, anthropomorphize non-humans by attributing human characteristics to them. This led me to wonder, what are the main criteria that determine what counts as science? Eventually, I came across the work of Potawatomi botanist Robin Wall Kimmer, and she's really a moss specialist. She reflects on how her own people's language emphasized the active presence of non-humans in the world, including fungi. And this is a, a short quote from her book. Papui translates as, quote, the force which causes mushrooms to push up from the earth overnight. She says, as a biologist, I was stunned that such a word existed. In all its technical vocabulary, Western science has no such term, no words to hold this mystery. You'd think that biologists of all people would have words for life, but in dominant or, but in scientific language, our terminology is used to define the boundaries of our knowing. What lies beyond our grasp remains unnamed. And that's the end of that quote from Kimmer. When I asked several mycologists about the term Pui, they told me that they appreciated its specificity and onomatopoeic qualities. The last syllable, we, sounds like something that is moving, expanding up from the earth and into the air. The closest scientific term that they could think of to describe a mushroom's growth was hydraulic, whereby a mushroom uses water pressure to expand its parts. Others thought of turgor pressure to describe the pressure from within an organism's cells, but this did not necessarily capture all the dynamic forms of growth. Each of these terms tends to reduce this action in terms of engineering or physics. Perhaps the lay term mushroomed in some way describes this rapid and active growth by turning a noun into a verb. But in the past, this term has often been used to describe negative phenomena, such as mushrooming taxes or mushrooming crime. And the term mushroom cloud superseded the old name for the horror of a nuclear blast, which used to be called a cauliflower cloud, but somehow that never stuck. Kimmerer's term Popoe, however, resonated with a broader pattern found in other indigenous languages that describe many organisms as actively encountering the world. In fact, it was Kimmerer, along with other indigenous scholars such as Kim Talbert, who is Ayate Su, and Zoe Todd, who is Métis, who helped me reflect back on the particular consequences of the potential relationship between worldviews embedded in European languages more generally and within scientific language specifically. In particular, Kimmer helped me to read the scientific literature in a new light and to notice the ways that scientific English typically works to strip away the animacy of animals, plants, and fungi 
not only for scientists, but also for non-scientists, who use distancing language, such as the pronoun it or that for non-human animals, which effectively cast them as objects rather than subjects. As you have likely noticed in this book, I use pronouns of personhood for our kin. So I try to not just um, describe mushrooms as it or that. I'm not necessarily calling for an end to objectification, but trying to point out and question what we might describe as the often invisible everyday practices of human exceptionalism. So the, the, I talk about that in the beginning of the book, but the ways in which um, humans are often regarded as somehow exceptional outside, uh, utterly different from other forms of, of animals. And even human supremacy that are created through language and that reinforce conceptual categories. Let's briefly consider gendered pronouns. In the past decade, there is now an accepted third category for humans, they, which some now use as a default when they are not sure how a, another individual identifies or as a self-described term. We still, however, draw the line in another binary between humans who deserve gender pronouns and non-humans who don't. Even when we quote, know the sex of a wild bird, for example, people will usually avoid the term she or he and refer to the bird as it. One of the few exceptions are animals that have been brought within the family circle, such as dogs, cats, and other pets. Indeed, the way language reinforces a sense of a great divide between humans and the rest of the world at all levels is even deeper than the differences in gender between he and she and they and it, as evident in the custom of referring to persons as who and non-persons as that, a convention that I am eschewing in this book. And just the last little bit. One of the deeper underlying problems with mainstream biology is that it relentlessly describes the non-human world in passive and mechanical terms as not fully alive and dynamic. As Kimmer reveals, this conceptual framework and attitude toward other organisms exerts a powerful effect on how we construct biological knowledge and treat other organisms as things or as resources solely for human experiment use or profit. Although I've often heard people describe scientific articles as dry, I think they may be more accurately described as mechanistic. Almost none of the scientific readings I came across engendered a sense that, act, that fungi actively engage the world. Instead, they are described in a mechanical mode of stimulus response reactions, stimulated, for example, through chemical triggers. This mechanist notion of reaction and trigger is one of the main ways in which the current scientific orthodoxy renders organisms as passive making it hard to see them as active creators and participants in the world, that is, as world makers. How then might we begin to see fungi as dynamic and engaged organisms? And the last paragraph. With this question in mind, I set out to find alternative frameworks within the scientific literature, along with explanations for the rise and dominance, dominance of the mechanistic thinking that is so powerful today. As I describe here and in the following chapter, in order to learn specifically how mushrooms engage the world, I turn to the work of scientists who spent their lives watching and experimenting with plants and fungi. If we want to understand fungi as world makers, as carrying out daily activities and behaving and interacting with other species, what might Western biologists tell us? Interestingly, my openness to the idea that fungi might interact with other species had begun years earlier while working in China with ethnic E mushroom hunters in Southwest China's Yunnan province, another group of people who spend their lives observing and experimenting with fungi. I was curious if I could find a similar approach among Western scientists. In looking for such similarities, I also drew on my training in the anthropology of science to look critically at the production of Western biological knowledge in order to ask, how do the metaphors and perspectives that dominate modern biology shape what we know or think we know about the world? So I will um, end it there. And I know that you know these uh, these 
sections kind of often dive pretty deep in um, philosophically around different issues that are not necessarily part of uh, the everyday sets of conversations, but I hope even in their um, excerpted nature that um, that it was that you were able to kind of follow along with the the ideas and the kind of conversations that I became engaged with. And I will um, pretty much leave it at that. And I'd love to entertain some questions um, if you have some. So thank you. Question, you can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand. I'd also be happy to talk about um, what things were like for the Tibetans or E or as well. Looks like everybody's a little shy, so maybe you should do that. Okay. Maybe that'll raise some questions. Sure, sure. So um, one thing that was really interesting for me um, with uh, the ethnic Tibetans up there was after they began to be connected to these Matsutake markets, um, things really started to change. So first it was really slow. They basically found that some people in Japan were interested in them, but they were pretty much just picking young ones and pickling them in brine. And so this was something that they could do in this very slow kind of um, way through shipping. This is way before there are any kind of direct flights to Japan that, you know, in the mid 1980s, um, this part of, of China was really uh, pretty much closed to foreigners still into the, the mid to late 1980s. Um, and so it's almost purely done um, by all uh, Chinese dealers who would buy uh, a whole bunch of little Matsutake from uh, Tibetans up north, put them in the brine, bring them on truck, and then figure out ways to sometimes even be trucking them all the way out to Shanghai, which is, you know, uh, more than uh, probably about a thousand miles or so, and then eventually out to Japan. But later on, um, Thing, the infrastructure started to build up and it was interesting. I was just telling a friend that uh, it was so difficult and many of these were kind of dirt roads and cobblestone roads that at first they tried to fill the, the fresh Matsutake in these uh, baskets, but they were just bounced around on these um, incredibly difficult roads so much that they were basically worthless by the time they did the 10 hour drive to the 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 capital market and there was a while where then they hired uh, villagers to wear on their these baskets full of matsutake on their back and basically act like human uh, shock absorbers uh, on the truck uh, to bring them down <laughs> but and it's you know it's the matsutake season is the same time as the monsoon so a little bit you know like the the, the California uh, scenario and so it because we're in really, really steep areas on the edge of the Himalayas, there are a lot of mudslides uh, there. So the Matsutake dealers these days are some of the key ways in which the mudslides are dealt with quickly. So when somebody has a huge load of, you know, 2000 pounds of Matsutake in the back of the truck, they're the ones that have the money to hire the crews to come out in the middle of the night and to use excavators or dynamite to open up uh, these roads, these kind of precarious roads. And um, it's, so it's changed in part the transportation infrastructure. And I'll just say one more thing, because I think there are probably some questions coming in. I don't know if somebody else can, somebody can look at those um, in terms of the chat, maybe you, Natalie. Um, but the one more, one other thing I was going to say is that some families decided to actually sell off their herds of yaks in order to be able to devote themselves to the, the fall-based Matsutake um, market. And so you have these families sometimes who have had yaks in their uh, family for so many generations. I mean, sometimes over a thousand years that have kind of shifted from 
a much more kind of yak centered uh, lifestyle where you're bringing them up far to into the mountains to graze during the summer and then bringing them down uh, down to the grasslands in the winter and you're raising a lot of food especially uh, for the yaks and so just that kind of transformation of 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 kind of having the whole cycle of life be around the needs of this one animal as well as all the amazing things that you know yaks provide including the manure for for cooking far above the tree line to you know the kind of uh, frequent source of small cash through milk and through butter and through cheese and then the occasional windfall when you sell a whole um, yak and it's mostly a kind of local market and then they've shifted totally uh, to the uh, Matsutake as that's almost purely shipped um, to Japan. So then they've kind of tied themselves into uh, the global market in a way that, you know, the their own well-being just so much rises and falls with uh, the price that's fetched in Tokyo and, and, and Kyoto. So they've really kind of you know, some some families really regret the kind of precarity that they um, then experience in that way. But you know, other other families are are glad for the um, the flexibility and sometimes you know, occasional the windfall profits that that they can have through through switching from the yak to the matsutake. So Natalie, I'm not sure if there's somebody that has some question. questions here. Um, it looks like you more or less addressed the first one. What was it like hunting with the experts over there? You described that mm. well. Um, and then we have another question. What was it about Matsutake that attracted your attention? Mm, okay. Yeah, well, I will. Thank you. And I will say a little bit about um, traveling, you know, hunting with the experts there and it's really pretty amazing just to see the scenario. And I described some of this in, in the book of how, you know, you're right before dawn while it's still dark. Uh, some, some mornings I climbed up to the nearby hillside. So you basically have um, these kind of compact villages of Tibetan folks and E folks. And there was one morning where it was still dark and I just got to see hundreds and hundreds of little specks of light just kind of fanning out from the village and just start moving up into the hills. So there you have people that, you know, from little kids to the elderly are all going out. They're all kind of pooling um, their resources for the, for the family. And they're hunting from early, early in the morning until like usually around noon or, or one or so. And then they'd have to try to sell, come back to the village to sell it at to the village market. And I have some, some great photos of the uh, market. Actually, there are some up on my website and some um, are in color and um, black and white in the book. Uh, but they can sometimes create these markets and um, kind of have more control uh, the, the dealings with these um, dealers who may or may not be um, Tibetan. Uh, but to be with them is very humbling because these are people that, it's interesting, they're walking almost always in, in the same area, in this kind of maybe, you know, uh, within say four miles from their village center and they're just covering this terrain over and over and people are, incredibly skilled at um, often using uh, kind of like walking sticks and, you know, not, none of the mushrooms, none of the matsutake really up and visible in that way. They're almost always as mushrooms. And so like their ability to, to find these mushrooms and to just know that land um, so intimately was really incredible. But, you know, they also said that for some of them, going back to the 60s, you know, during times of famine, that's when they kind of move to uh, a deeper interest uh, in these mushrooms. But there's not like a um, an older uh, legacy of a deep passion among Tibetans for for matsutake. It's kind of a, a, a new thing, and some some of them though develop an interest in it and eating it um, at, as they hunt it. Um, but yeah, really interesting to watch them. To also, one of the things I talk about in the book was for the E, we're very interested in 
noticing the insects that hunt Matsutake. And I remember seeing one of the first um, e influence mushroom guides that was published in, in the back, it described, you know, a handful of the different insects that, uh, especially different flies that are also hunting Matsutake and, and, and other insects and uh, identified them. And I thought that was really interesting to pay that much attention to the insects, which is something that um, just doesn't seem to happen quite as much uh, in North America. And to really, um, to also to observe how these different insects would find the matsutake or other mushrooms. So some of the insects would hunt more by sight and some more by smell and some from above and some from below. And uh, I found that really um, fascinating just to see um, not only how they were, you know, trying to, to hunt for the pot, but how they realized that they were just one of many hunters um, going out there and how they, they paid attention to them, to these insects, and then how they tried to trick the insects through kind of disguising um, the Matsutake through using sometimes saran wrap around them or, or piles of sand. And then, but how they're trying to do that on the one hand um, with their um, insect competitors, but then um, then they were worried about then and making it more obvious for their human competitors. Um, but then there would be, just like in Japan, there'd be some places where people, where a group of people could actually lease a whole mountain. And so sometimes they would pay a, a large sum of money to the village that would lease to usually a small group um, controlled by an entrepreneur and he would have guards kind of stationed there in these little um, like tents. And there they would do more experiments there because they could really control more of who was coming in and out. But, but basically these are, it's very, very different than the whole Oregon scene where, you know, it's a relatively small, in Oregon, of course, right, it's relatively a smaller number of people that live there and hunt in their backyard. There's so many people coming in from, from outside, but the places where, where I was for Matsutake, it's almost always people that have lived in an area for sometimes centuries. Um, so I did want to say a little bit about that. Um, actually, you had, and you had a second question there, Natalie. What was the? Whoopsies. Uh, what was it about Matsutake that attracted your attention? For me, yeah. Well, this was... It was interesting. It was actually David Aurora's um, idea originally. So I worked, I went to, uh, did my undergraduate degree at UC Santa Cruz. And there I had the great fortune of meeting an amazing anthropologist named Anna Singh. And Anna Singh was thinking about her next project. And at that point, she actually didn't know that much about um, mushrooms, but she was getting more and more um, mushroom curious, mushroom interested. And she had a conversation with David Aurora and said, um, I really want to study something, some object that would might tell us something different about globalization. There's a lot of people that talk about globalization as this homogenizing force to the kind of McDonaldization of the world. And I think there's something more to it. Is there perhaps any kind of, any mushroom that would be really um, helpful in trying to do a research project that might look kind of otherwise or alternatively at globalization? And um, David Aurora had just been to the same neck of the woods where I've been working for a quarter of a century and he's very excited about the place. I mean, it, it, it's, it's amazing with credible ethnic diversity, like dozens of groups and, and languages and, um, you know, really strong presence um, of, of, of these kind of cultural realms and, and forces and a huge mushroom loving uh, culture there with, you know, street markets with, you know, 20 different species for sale and and it's very, very common that people, uh, you know, love all kinds of mushrooms and um, that there's not that kind of mycophobia that we're, um, that we're used to here. Um, so David had just come back from that area and he said, well, 
of all of all the mushrooms that I can really think of Matsutake. The story of that is a really interesting interesting one, and you might give that a a whirl. And so Anna Singh uh, contacted myself, and then a handful of her other colleagues and and former students. And I was, you know, one of her former students in my undergrad days, and asked if we would be interested in doing research on this mushroom. And I was already at a, you know, kind of early stage, but but get, by getting pretty keen and, you know, hunting, you know, a handful of, of, of edible mushrooms in, um, in the Santa Cruz area, um, but still very early on in my learning. And, and uh, the place where I had done work for like my first major project, my first book, on environmentalism in China, I was just at the southern edge of the Matsutake realm. And I was mostly working with Nashi uh, people. And there was one Matsutake dealer in town, um, but there weren't too many. And I kind of knew um, it was really important up north. And I had never really worked with the E or Tibetan people. And um, and so I just thought, oh, I, you know, really admire um, Anna Singh's um, work. And I thought, oh, I totally should do this opportunity. And that will bring me back to a place in China that I, that I uh, love so much. So I um, jumped on that. And we became one of the, the, more, like the longer lasting um, collaborative projects in anthropology. And so my, my book, by the way, too, I should have said is, you know, the second book in a trilogy, and the first book is The Mushroom at the End of the World. And so Anna, Anna Singh wrote that one. I, mine just came out. And then there's a third, the last one in the trilogy is by uh, Shiho Satsuka. And she's mainly focusing on um, the politics of mushroom science in Japan. And one thing I could also say about our project, our collaborative project, um, as we followed Matsutake around the world, and I got to go to Japan to go inside the laboratories at the top uh, Japanese and, and international research teams as they were trying to figure out ways to raise Matsutake in the lab and up into the farmer's fields as the Japanese farmers are trying to figure out the, the temperature gradients and kind of like what kind of triggers their fruiting and get to see these really interesting experiments that Japanese researchers were doing to like sometimes with um, upside down umbrellas um, hanging in trees in the field and then with a little surgical tubing coming out the end to try to just do micro rain collection to feed uh, the what they call the, the the shiro which are just like the kind of uh, it means uh, white castle in Japanese, which are that kind of the mycelial hubs of Matsutake and do these kind of micro catchment experiments to see if they could uh, increase the, the fruiting of Matsutake and these beautiful shiro that they would uh, show years of different um, uh, different data collection using these different colored uh, chopsticks showing where um, different Matsutake had fruited. So we got to uh, travel and meet up um, in different countries around the world. And then I hosted all of the, um, the field work in China. And we even got to invite some North Korean scientists uh, for one of the first times at an international, we created an international um, Matsutake uh, conference with uh, folks from Japan and us from the U.S. and Canada and, um, and Chinese researchers who brought in some North Korean scientists who had very little access to the peer-reviewed literature but were very keen on really enhancing Matsutake, which is just such a huge part of the uh, North Korean international uh, economy. And that was fascinating. So we got to um, work together, so it wasn't just me. It was, um, it was mostly Shiho and and Anna Singh and myself, um, but uh, go all around to so many different places that uh, that none of us as individuals would necessarily have access to. So, yeah. All right, we have another uh, question about the market for the large ones. Was there a market for the big ones, or did they just get broken up on the way to market? Mm, yeah. Well, that's that's it. It's a good question, and into I mean, of course, if you've um, 
you know, picked Matsutake or some other different species, right? How when you pick them one time, they will, you know, they're still going through their growth cycle as as they as they move on. So, you know, as you probably know, whereas for some mushrooms like um, you know, chanterelles, they're often not really graded into the different grades. And one thing I found interesting though is that Matsutake are often seriously graded into sometimes four grades, five grades, six grades. There will be um, different companies that will have different systems. And that's part of the uh, expertise of the, of the buyers who will be getting a big collection of Matsutake in from the field collectors. And they have to quickly, you know, kind of put a bunch in the grade one or two or three or four or what have you. But with the large ones, if they're fully, fully open, they often did not fetch um, much of a of a high price, and you know, of course, there uh, depends on the conditions under which they're kept, and you know how cold it is, and um, that the the cold temperatures. If you can have them in refrigerators, it can keep them from fully expanding if they're um, partially open, um, but. One of the tricks, of course, of Matsutake is they never want um, them to be frozen to get the high price. So you have the kind of trying to keep a cool chain and you're doing this in, in places where there may not be electricity or reliable electricity. So it creates a lot of challenges. Um, so yeah, with a lot of the, um, the fully open one, there ended up becoming a market in dried Matsutake there. But of course, like the Japanese are not typically that interested or interested at all in dried Matsutake, but um, it, the word began to get out about this special mushroom. And so you started having uh, Chinese tourists from the big cities, from Beijing, from Shanghai, from different places coming up into this area and they all wanted to have Matsutake. And of course, a lot of them weren't there during the, the rainy season when they were coming up. So you would start to see as part of the domestic tourism industry, um, uh, big, jars of, of dried matsutake, which you know, the restaurants would um, serve up. But one of the kind of interesting twists going on to the other end of the spectrum is that for various reasons, and this was a little bit um, confusing to figure out the whole internal politics of this, but the um, there was a petition put forward by CITES, which is the, you know, the Convention of the International Trade of Endangered Species, Put forward by the Chinese-based um, CITES group to to declare um, Matsutake a threatened species, and so then this enabled them to create rules and regulations about their international movement. So they basically shut down what sometimes are called the babies or the button version of Matsutake, and they did not allow those to uh, be shipped internationally. But then what we found kind of interesting and surprising was then um, the dealers who ended up with these mushrooms, it didn't stop the picking of them. They ended up creating a Matsutake button industry of freezing them. And evidently you could still just, you know, pick them and, and do this. Um, the, the main uh, regulations were just about their international trade. So they started to create a, um, you know, just the little buttons in frozen packs and try to um, to create a new culinary market for things like the Spring Festival that's really important in China um, to encourage people to do that. But it was interesting in the uh, areas that the places where people often um, pick them in the greatest densities, the local people often ended up kind of slowly falling in love with Matsutake, um, whereas in their early stages, they're like, well, we have so many more mushrooms that taste so delicious, like including the porcini, but um, other mushrooms that we don't have here in, um, in North America that a lot of people were kind of curious of what's all this hoopla about for the Japanese. Um, we, don't, we don't even really appreciate it, but I, I did get to watch over time that, that people did become more and more um, interested in it and, and got into it. Okay. We do have another question in the chat um, asking if there's any evidence of indigenous peoples or First Nations use of Matsutake on the west coast of this continent. And also, can you describe Matsutake, 
Matsutake culture in British Columbia? Mm, sure. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I really hope we get to learn a lot more about um, indigenous relationships to, to Matsutake. Um, there is a filmmaker named Tristan uh, Stotch who is based in Portland. And I got to meet him at one of the um, edible um, fungi conferences in Japan some years ago. And He's a really interesting researcher and a filmmaker, and he's done some wonderful films about um, Japanese Americans and like the depth of their relationship to Matsutake and how that's changed over time. But he also has been coming up into British Columbia, especially along the, the mighty um, Fraser River up uh, along in, in this, <laughs> this area on my map around present day Lytton and developing uh, relationships with the Sepetmik people there to learn more about their, um, their history with Matsutake. Um, and there is a new article out by one of uh, BC's most famous uh, ethnobotanists named Nancy Turner about the indigenous uses of mushrooms. So I'm really excited to, to read that. Um, I've been a big fan of Nancy Turner for a long time. Uh, I do know um, for in the uh, Yurok and Karak territory of Northern uh, California that there they're often called the, you know, the Tanuk mushroom um, because they have a relationship uh, there. And I do know that they were often really, really valued. And there's some uh, theories that too, that there could have even been some kind of management of the trees through things like selective burning in different places to try to encourage that. But I think it's still uh, pretty sparse um, documentation of that in kind of scientific literature. But I do think we are going to find um, way more uh, indigenous relationships to mushrooms than, um, than used to be assumed. And part of that, again, is that many of the, um, the early ethnobotanists or the early, you know, anthropologists or missionaries that were writing things down, um, if they came from the Anglo tradition, they often had some kind of, as you know, some kind of mycophobia. So it's something that they often didn't really ask as much about in general. I mean, there are always exceptions. Um, so I think that's part of this kind of, um, you know, I'm in British Columbia and it feels very British in many ways. And, you know, or Oregon and, and um, you know, Washington also had a, have a deep history of, you know, a, a predominance of, of British people who were kind of doing the accounts of what we became, what came to be known as, you know, the, the ethnomycological literature. So I hope to, uh, to learn more about that. Um, and I think it will be expanding. Oh, and then uh, the, the, the culture in terms of British Columbia, it's really fascinating here. Uh, when the prices were really, really high, you know, there was a time when in Japan, sometimes like a kilogram, you know, 2.2 pounds of Matsutake could reach $2,000. And, you know, those, those prices have skyrocketed and plummeted and they just, they tend to be incredibly volatile. And the price of Matsutake is one of the most volatile commodities that I know of in the world. Like it'll change within a day and change dramatically season to season. So in, in BC, um, when, the prices were high. Uh, there were a number of uh, First Nations, that's um, one of the terms here for Indigenous folks, um, would sometimes be helicoptered out into the middle of a picking area, and then they would pick all day and be helicoptered back. And the wealth from Matsutake became like this really interesting angle to start to argue for greater access to land, because just like in, in the States that, you know, sometimes, you know, 90, 98, 99% of their land has been kind of claimed by the state. And so it's interesting to see some of these places where logging used to be really big, but it has kind of fallen by the wayside and in part for a number of reasons. 
but then there was the Matsutake boom that um, that created a, a whole new way to think about land and 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 the politics of land and um, there was a, a strong degree of, of indigenous presence and then in, in a city like Vancouver that is um, one of the has one of the largest Asian populations outside of of Asia, uh, especially for uh, friends who are in, you know, of Japanese descent or Korean descent, Matsutake is so big. And so I've got some Korean neighbors who, you know, they're in their 80s. And during the, the fall season, they'll wake up sometimes and there'll just be a beautiful basket of Matsutake on their doorstep. And so these are people that you know, with are, are well known within the, the Korean community and people will just kind of um, collect for them and, and bring them bring them on to talk. And of course, up in um in in Oregon and Washington, there are places for um where the, the Japanese Americans have been picking for a long time. And there'll be special places where are that's it's known that they're prolific and then alongside the road they'll especially be leaving some for the elderly to pick. So there's this idea of, of kind of um, being very conscientious about their value um, for the broader community there that I, I find really interesting. So one more question. Sorry, I'm, I keep forgetting to unmute myself. Uh, there's another question in the chat about locals using the matsutake once they adopted it. Was it incorporated into existing dishes or given unique preparations? And I assume this is about the Tibetan. Yeah, that's part what of it. Say. Yeah, Tibetan and e. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of times people in the um, you know would be using some of the same spice uh, regime. Uh, that they had used for others, but um, too, there was actually this kind of real deep love for um, raw matsutake in, in a lot of areas, which is something that I hadn't really come across um, otherwise. Like so many people very religiously will, you know, grill it or put it in soups or other things. So there was this big kind of interest in, um, in having it raw. And I find one of the things I find so interesting is that I talked to this one guy that I described, I have some stories about him in the book and he's an amazing musician. And he went, he showed me this thin uh, twig that he had. And he said, yeah, you know, when we were kids, we would go out and find, you know, four or five matsutake and just pierce them right through the middle of the, of the mushroom and have them on a twig. And we would just sell it like that. And he said, oh, it's just so painful now to think of, you know, how we basically destroyed these mushrooms, you know, by, by piercing them and they would just go old and we didn't really respect them back then. And people used to say, yeah, throw them in the soup. But, you know, if you have tofu, that's better. He said, now we just have such a different um, mindset on this uh, that, you know, now we, we really value them. But these are people that, you know, often, you know, would eat dozens of different mushrooms and it's a it's a really interesting place there's there's some kind of really differently hallucinogenic mushrooms up there and they talk about the little little people um, that come out when you eat some and then there's some really interesting um, and horrible cases of, of mass um, deaths through through mushrooms it's a very culturally rich place and a very um, mushroom rich place in a place of people that are the, the E are mostly goat herders, right? And of course the, the Tibetans are yak herders. So these are people that are very closely uh, connected to the land. Like very few people in these areas have, would have a, a nine to five job. They're very um, oriented towards like self-sufficient farming, um, but also of course integrated in the cash economy um, to some degree, but uh, they've, really you know brought uh the matsutake within their in their vast repertoire of, of fungal dishes and to say too if any of you guys get a chance now that things well we'll, we'll see what happens in china as they keep trying to do their zero covid policy but if you get a chance if things open up later i would really recommend if you go to the the main capital of yunnan province of, of kunming 
which is at, at about a mile elevation, but it's still at it's at the um, the Tropic of Cancer, so it's a kind of subtropical place um, the, on the edge of the Himalayas, and they have some incredible restaurants where you can get you know twenty different mushroom dishes um, cooked up for you. So it's a it's a place where the the mushrooms are diverse and the love is is so deep and um, and it's a, it's a great place to to just like, you know, look at the markets and go to the pick with pick with people and um, go to the restaurants and just have your taste buds um, blown away by all the different uh, preparations that um, that that people do in very creative ways. So. Okay. And it looks like um, Lena posted a link to an article, and she's wondering if it's by Nancy Turner. Oh, okay. Is this the article that you were referring to? Can you see the chat? No, uh, let me see. Oh, uh, it's stuck, and it's just downloading. It hasn't opened up yet, but was it within the last year or so? Uh, yes, yes, that's it. Good work. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. I'm sure well, I'll read it later. Uh, does anybody else have any questions, <laughs> either in chat or if you want to raise your hand or unmute yourself and ask a question? Michael, do you have any questions for any of us? Um. I just, uh, I guess too, um, for you guys, it would be, what do you, what do you think are, um, as much as like we're having this kind of mushroom renaissance take place where, you know, it's not just us weirdos <laughs> who are interested in mushrooms, what you're seeing other other groups, um, uh, you know, kind of widespread appreciation. Are there some things that you think are um, maybe potentially problematic or um, there may be some different like misunderstandings of mushrooms or do you have different concerns about uh, the rise of the mush, what some people are calling the mushroom renaissance? I'm just kind of curious just uh, amongst a uh, group group of people that have been probably deeply involved in this for a number of years. Do you have anything you'd like to share? I guess one of the things I'm concerned about is with this big renaissance, there's still a tremendous amount of fear Mm -hmm. out in the world about mushrooms, about what they can do for you, or what they can do to you. Can they kill you? Every time somebody hears that I'm a mushroom hunter, they just assume that, you know, I'm living life on a knife edge. And it's <laughs> it's just not like that, I don't think. Um, yeah. I think we're all very careful people. There are, you know, lots of old sayings. There, what is it? The There are old mushroom hunters and bold mushroom hunters, but no old, bold mushroom hunters or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's pretty fascinating too. There's a big interest in medicinal mushrooms in general, specifically psychedelic mushrooms. I think there's a big space in our society for learning more about that. Um, yeah, anybody else? Yeah, I, I think you're so right about the, um, the like that deep seated, that fear issue. And it's just, I mean, fascinating too to be in Japan where the, that that fear is, is not there at all. And they had this amazing, um, chart of the hundred most um, important mushrooms in Japanese culture. And I would just love to see something like that done for the States or Canada, um, where it's just hard to imagine people, you know, kind of coming up to that list. Um, uh, one thing too, I'm also wondering about is, is it still very, very utilitarian, like in terms of like how mushrooms will save us and, you know, what might be some other things but uh, but uh, but uh, in general i'm i'm excited that there are more and more people are are interested in when oh, one just um small question here for with mayumi was asking about matsutake in santa cruz yes it does and you know 
um, I will say I found it, but with David Aurora's tutelage um, growing around associated with rhododendron, it seemed to be. Um, and yeah, thanks, um, Ronnie. I, I don't mean it like I I'm happy that the Renaissance is happening and I don't I don't have any idea of of stepping on toes. And I definitely had an interesting conversation with a biologist actually the night before last and, you know, he might uh, think I'm stepping on toes. So um, there. Oh, and this I think is from Mike. How many countries export Matsutake to Japan? That's a good question. Uh, my rough guess is about a dozen. So Turkey, Morocco, Mexico, uh, several countries in Scandinavia, including Finland, you know, U.S., uh, they say Mexico, Canada, um, South Korea, North Korea, uh, um, and a little bit seems like maybe from Nepal, but it's a bit um a bit scattered uh there and then um why do they have give up the traditional way of life completely for a short matsutake season yeah that's a good question uh, it is interesting right because the dealing with the yaks is 365 days a year right it's something that is there and you know it's one thing i did uh find out recently was that there was a larger trend of um, yak herding people not only tibetan but others throughout the himalayas who are also um starting to give up on the yak and so it it helps me to realize you know just the the matsutake the attractiveness of it is just is one element that that plays a role but it's not the the only role of course um it's um it's it's a complex one and certainly like too it's interesting the um for the e like nobody's giving up herding their um their goats and goats are a little bit more of a flexible uh species in certain ways um where they don't have to be kind of brought up into the into the high pastures but then of course the the goat herders are not living up nearly so high of an elevation um yeah, so it could, uh, Mayumi's asking, there could also be some, I mean, certainly there's a lot of Tanook in uh, Santa Cruz, um, but it seems like it may have some different associations. Um, and then is Tibetan and Japanese Matsutake the same species? It is interesting, like this whole question of what will count as the species boundary, right? And so that's one thing I mentioned a little bit in my book that, you know, our whole notion of species and where a species begins and another one ends is something that was often um, based or is more on a kind of animal definition of around this question of, you know, do, can it uh, mate with another and then have the next generation have viable offspring, right? So that becomes a little bit of a more difficult uh, thing to, to, to consider when it comes to, to fungi. And, um, but they often, you know, the, the Tibetans, uh, or the Japanese rather often consider them, you know, a, a, a different species. I have a, a interesting, um, uh, I don't know if I can find it easily, but a map in the book, um, that talks about at, at one point, there were three main, um, uh, divisions of, of Matsutake, but they, um, they kind of, let's see. Let's see if you can see that about it's like movement across um, the world. And and the on the on the website it shows the um, three different colors with different species. There's a, a Berkeley had an amazing um, geneticist who tried to look at at the evolution of this. Let's see. Um, again, so yeah, how many different kinds of Matsutake mushrooms are there? Um, have you heard of the white matsutake? Uh, I haven't actually heard that much of the of um, the white matsutake mushroom in the Pacific Northwest. Maybe somebody else uh, has more information than I do. And it's funny because you know I've uh, been living here for 15 years, but I have really so focused my work on um, China or Japan. So it's only you know the last year um, that I. Uh, went out to to find uh, Matsutake in uh, in BC and was very happy to find a lot. If they grow in Bolivia, 
Um, I have not heard of Matsutake in South America, but it certainly could be possible. I mean, one of the interesting things there, right, is that the Japanese call it Matsutake, which means pine mushroom. And they're very much um, understood to be a pine-based relationship one, but it does live in association with a kind of evergreen oak in Southwest China, which I was, was curious too, like if it could um, form uh, associations with the evergreen um, oak um, in, uh, in the West Coast. Right, and Miami says, yes, it does grow in Mexico. So Mexico for sure, but in South America proper, I haven't yet heard of it, but I could easily imagine it, it does um, live there. And it's one of these kind of mushrooms that's really interesting that is so venerated in Korea and Japan, but in many places around the world, it's not especially sought after um, historically. And so I feel like it's one of those mushrooms that it, it may take those active um, searchers to go try to, to find it and to, you know, expand its, its known range. Like here in, in BC, we just had a few truffle dogs that were trained, you know, in the last decade, and they really expanded the, um, the realm of uh, what we know about uh, truffles quite dramatically. And so there was not, you know, trained scientists. Um, there was just, you know, somebody named Brooke and her dog that got trained up in Oregon, who was not like a specially bred dog for for truffles and um, she she and her dog were able to um, just started getting truffle fever and expand expanded the knowledge of uh, truffles throughout British Columbia quite uh, extensively. So I mean I think you all know too and you get to see that um, probably people in your club are expanding the known range of certain species or you'll, you're the ones that are paying attention you know when the weather shifts and all of a sudden something that used to only be found um, further south of you will all of a sudden seem to jump um, overnight and to appear. And if, you know, if you, especially if you guys are, uh, have people that can consult the, you know, the herbarium, the, you know, the kind of vouchers and, and, and see what's there. It's, it's really amazing to me that like how important it is for the amateur um, pickers, amateur mycologists to really play such a key role in, in, in the, um, in the realm of expanding that knowledge. Another, uh, question in the chat, uh, what are the poisonous lookalikes? Hmm. That would be, that's a great, uh, uh, Brit uh, Bunyard question. He's so good on the whole um, lookalikes, and he has some great um, sets of photos there. But I mean, the main thing with Matsutake, and it's interesting, um, you were um, saying earlier that, you know, uh, Natalie, that you thought you'd found the Matsutake and then had your kind of teleconference with somebody to to uh, suss it out. And of course, uh, you know, the key, key thing beside all the basic characteristics of the gills, the the texture of the stalk and everything is that distinctive smell. But you know, that's something that not everybody can um, can tell. And definitely sometimes in the Pacific Northwest there is um, uh, uh, a mushroom that looks very, very close and it sometimes gets thrown into the baskets, but it doesn't have that like that incredibly spicy um, cinnamony smell that just um, drives a lot of people crazy. It's a it's, it actually has its own chemical name the Matsutake, Matsutake soul, and it's it's interesting because I think like evolutionary biologists typically assumed it was there to repel everything, um, to make it less vulnerable to insect attack, but yet there are certain slugs and others that, um, that do seek it out. So it's got this very distinctive uh, aroma that, that nothing else has. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever gone to, um, uh, Natalie, to have you ever seen the candy cane plants? I have, yeah. Actually, I found a huge, huge crop of them on Mount Shasta a few years ago before I even knew what was up. I, I was sure I found a bunch of white asparagus. Like, I knew nothing <laughs> about mushrooms. Yeah. Looking back, I know, like, everything was perfect to be Matsutake 
hunting right. grounds, right? But prohibited in the location that I was. But no, oh. it's and and interestingly, I the, the few times I've found Matsutake in California, I've not seen the Allotropa Fregata. Right, right. So. Yeah. So it is interesting. It's definitely one of those, like it's an indicator of its mycelial presence, but yet they're the, yeah, I would say the vast, vast majority of places where Matsutake grows, you don't see the allotropa. But I, one thing I was going to say is that some people um, at the beginning of Matsutake season, you know how like we think so much about the search image and some people think about the search smell. And even Ana Singh has got a really good, uh, well-attuned nose that's far better than mine. And she goes to her little allotropa patch in Santa Cruz and gets down and re sniffs that mycelia just so she can just kind of get her nose attuned. And sometimes she will smell the matsutake before she sees them, which to me, I, I can't imagine doing. I just don't have that sophisticated. Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, so, yeah. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Speak up now. <laughs> Well, I, I think if we don't have any more questions, we'll say thank you, Michael. We really appreciate you uh, speaking for us tonight and, um, I don't know, stoking the fires of our obsessions about mushrooms. <laughs> That's great. Thanks so much for the invite and just great to see you all and see your, um, see your names and uh, hope to cross paths in the future. Thanks, Lena, for finding the uh, article so quick, amazing. And- uh, Oh, looks like we have a couple of hands up, sorry. Pascal? Okay. Oh, that was clap, clap. Oh, clap, <laughs> clap, okay, never mind. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.